My cats are losing Carrie. Yeah. 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 Yeah
and they work the deal out. They don't even call you. They write the contract up themselves. Guess who still owed a commission? The listing firm is. Another firm brings us a buyer. We still owe a commission. If we produce a buyer, like we hold an open house and the buyer comes from that, or we owe a commission. Under any circumstance where a ready, willing, and able buyer is produced, the firm is owed a commission if we've utilized what type of listing agreement? Exclusive right to sell. You have to know the whole name. Just the word exclusive is not enough because there's another one with the word exclusive in it, and it's different. The exclusive right to sell listing. And why is this the most common one? It's the most protection for the firm. It gets us paid under the broadest set of circumstances. Can you think of any circumstance where we would not get paid under this listing agreement? Uh, if somebody doesn't buy it. That's the only one if it doesn't sell. That's it. Because if it sells, while we have one of these listing agreements, we are owed that commission under any circumstances. Everybody okay with that? So let's talk about the exclusive agency listing. The exclusive agency. Now we still have that word exclusive. So that means the seller is agreeing to only work with how many firms? One. There's, the seller's only going to have one firm representing them. So let's talk about how this is different than the exclusive right to sell listing. We said there were pretty much three channels that buyers could come from. Give them to me again. What were those three channels? The listing firm produces the buyer, that's one. Another firm produces a buyer, so a buy, uh, uh, the, another firm acting as a buyer's agent brings us a buyer, right? And the seller could potentially bring a buyer themselves, right? And under the exclusive right to sell listing, any of those would result in a what? Payment of commission. Does everybody go with that? In the exclusive agency, only two of those result in a commission. If my firm produces a buyer, do you think we're still going to get paid? Yes. Yes. If another real estate firm produces a buyer, you think we're still going to get paid? Yes. Yes. If the seller sells it themselves? No. Essentially, an exclusive agency listing is the seller saying, I will pay you if the buyer comes from your work. But if I do it myself, I'm not paying you. If I sell it myself, I'm not paying you a commission. That's an exclusive agency listing. And that actually sounds pretty reasonable. Most of the time when you describe that to people, they're like, okay, well, I mean, if I didn't sell it, I really shouldn't get paid. Here's going to be the problem with that in practical purposes. You know, I mentioned if, if, the, if the buyer's out, the buyer drives through and the seller's out front cutting their grass, how did the buyer know to stop in front of that particular house? You had a sign out There was a sign out there. And whose sign was it? Yours. Oh, it was my sign. Or even if they, how did they know to drive through that particular neighborhood? Were they just luck through that neighborhood or? They saw it where? They saw it online and who put it online? I did. So they drove through the neighborhood because they saw my listing online. They knew it was that house because they saw my sign out front. When the seller did take them in to show it to them, they probably gave them a flyer that who did, that I drew up, right? Who sold the house? Actually, you did. I did. Am I going to get paid? No. Not under that type of agreement. You begin to see why this agreement is not very popular? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You're never going to see one of these in real life. But you got to know it for test taking purposes. So what's the big differentiating factor here between the exclusive right to sell listing and this listing? If the buyer sells it. I mean, the seller sells it. Sell. If the seller the produces the buyer, then they don't have to, what, pay the firm a commission. Is everybody good with that? Right. You need to be able to recognize that on a test. Okay? Still exclusive, because how many firms have we hired? One. Just one. Let's talk about the last one. Look at that picture. How many signs are in front of that listing? A lot. So what, what word have we lost? Exclusive. exclusive. We are no longer exclusive. We are in an open relationship now. <laughs> An open listing. An open listing. No exclusivity, which means the seller can hire how many firms? As many as they want. As many as they want. And they're agreeing to only compensate the firm that does what? 
that brings them the buyer. So we started with the exclusive right to sell listing. We said there were three channels where we could get paid on that one, right? If my firm produces the buyer, if another firm produces the buyer, or if the seller sells it themselves, I would get paid in all three of those circumstances with an exclusive right to sell, correct? Right. On this one, how many of those channels are going to work to get me paid? Just one. If my firm produces the buyer. If another firm produces the buyer, am I going to get paid? No. No. If the seller sells it themselves, am I going to get paid? No. no. That's the open listing. And I don't even think they exist, quite honestly. I know the book says they exist, but I've never seen one. Never seen one. I have actually seen an exclusive agency. I've never seen I use one, but I've seen the piece of paper. So this one I, is like a unicorn. I don't know where they exist, but if you see one, tell me about it. Do we understand the three different types here, though? Everybody okay with that? Because you're going to have to differentiate them on the test. They will test you about them. Which one's by far the most common? Exclusive right to sell. Right sell. Yeah, absolutely. Which, by the way, look, if you look at the one that I handed out that we're going to go through, it is the what? Exclusive right to sell. Yeah. Right? So, let's talk about that exclusive right to sell listed agreement. But we want to talk about it and we want to go through it to take a look at it. Um, and I will put it up here on the screen as well so that we can go through it. I printed a copy for you guys and I'll put it up on the screen so that we can go through it. This is just that reminder that I gave you early on. I wanted to give it to you early because your brains were fresher. The commission, the North Carolina Real Estate Commission, do they publish this form? Yes. yes. No. No? no? No, you gotta be a member. The Real Estate Commission doesn't publish what? Forms. They don't write forms for you to use. They are not there to help you do business. They're there to regulate you. Who do these forms come from? The National Association of Realtors or the North Carolina Association of Realtors. So these forms are there for people who decide to join the Association of Realtors. Why do we teach you these particular ones? because they're the most common ones. This does not come from the Real Estate Commission. The Real Estate Commission does not write this form. They don't endorse this form. Now, the Real Estate Commission does set the basic rules of what may, must be in any listing agreement. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Because that's their job, to say, this is what a listing agreement should look like. You draft whatever you want as long as it meets this criteria. And this, these forms do meet the Real Estate Commission's criteria. All right? So this one that we're going to talk about is by far the most common one. All right? So, some things that I'm going to point out along the way, and I'm just going to kind of run through them quickly here, and then we're going to look at the actual agreement. Look at this middle bullet point here, the extender clause. That's something you should star in your notes, the extender clause. The word extender, think about what we said had to be in any listing agreement or any buyer agency agreement. It must have an expiration date. So what do you think extender refers to? Going past the expiration date. Here's what an extender clause really is. <clears throat> Transactions aren't always cut and dry things. Is it possible that a buyer who looks at a house while it's listed ends up buying it after the listing expires? Yes. You think that's a possibility? Yes. The extender clause is there to protect the firm in that event. So they still get paid. It, that if the buyer became interested in the property while we had it listed, you still owe us a commission even though they bought it after our listing agreement was had expired. That's the extended clause. Does that make sense for you guys? It's there to protect the firm. Now, it's not like a golden shield of protection. There's one big gotcha there from the firm's perspective. Look at the last line in that bullet point. As long as the seller hasn't what? Hired a new firm. If they've hired a new firm, who's going to get paid? The new firm. The new firm. Okay? So it's only there to pr protect you after expiration of the old agreement if they don't enter into a new agreement with somebody else. Everybody good with that idea? Because as soon as they hire another firm, the extender clause goes away. And, we'll, and I'll point it out to you in the agreement, and, we'll, and I'll show you where that works, okay? Um, things to keep in mind when you're filling out a listing agreement. What sell, which sellers need to be listed on a listing agreement? All of them. The answer is all of them. 
In other words, if you've got a married couple who owns a house, how many of them have to sign that listing? Both do. Because both, both are going to have to sign the sales contract ultimately as well, right? It takes one to buy and two to sell. Exactly. So all sellers need to be listed. Don't ever take a listing where you don't have all the seller's signatures. Where you haven't personally met with all the sellers to know that they all want to sell this property and that they all are in agreement on what the terms of the listing are going to be. Make sure you get all the sellers together. And, and just from me to you, I wouldn't trust a situation where somebody says, oh, I'll get them to sign it when they get home. No, 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 you will not. I will meet with them. Because how do you know they actually sign it? If you're meeting with one spouse, oh, and I'll get my wife to sign it when she gets home. How do you know that he didn't sign for her as soon as you walked out the door? Be careful of those sorts of things. When you're dealing with clients who are not sitting in front of you or clients you're not familiar with, is it maybe appropriate to ask for their ID before letting them sign that listing agreement? Absolutely. When I have clients sign electronically, I ask them to scan a copy of their ID so I can keep it in my file. So that I at least know that I'm dealing with the person I think I'm dealing with. Does that make sense for you guys? Those are the kinds of things you have to be aware of with those sorts of things. All right. Um, we talked about the fact that it had to be an expiration date. And the commission that's charged is usually going to be some percent of the sales price. That's usually how we set commissions on a listing agreement. It's almost always some percentage of sales price. We, 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 we could potentially also have flat fee commissions. Some firms charge a flat fee rather than a percentage of the sales price, you know, $1,000, $5,000, whatever. That's what a flat fee would be. It's just a number. This is what we charge. Boom. Um, the most common, though, is a percentage of the sales price. There is also the potential to have what we call a net commission. Now, this is probably something you've never heard of because, quite honestly, you probably should never see it. The Real Estate Commission really discourages this type of a commission. It's not illegal but it's highly discouraged. A net commission is when a seller says to you, I need $150,000. I don't care what you sell it for. So what's my commission going to be? Oh, whatever. whatever is what? Above $150,000. Why do you think the Real Estate Commission would highly discourage that type of listing agreement? I'm sorry? Well, it is a little bit like price fixing, but think about it. your job is to protect your client's best interest, right? So brokers could lie about, about how much what the house is worth and then sell it for more. Right there, yeah. right yeah. there. Because what are they relying on to, for the list price? They're relying on what? Advice. My advice. So if I know that I'm going to keep every dollar above a hundred and above whatever that net number is, I have an incentive to try to push them to list it for what? for a lower number because the lower their number is the more my potential number is as far as commission goes. Does that make sense for you guys? And that's why the Real Estate Commission highly discourages that type of a listing. But you need to know what a net listing is. Just FYI, it is when the seller just sets a minimum amount and your commission is anything above that amount. Is everybody good with that? The Real Estate Commission much prefers the percentage model or a flat fee model than, than any kind of a net model. Okay? Um, we talked about the fact that it had to be a non-discrimination statement. Brokers are never allowed to discriminate in transactions. And we must identify the listing broker and their license number. All right? So, let's take a look at the actual agreement itself. And I'm going to open it up here on the screen. Load up zip forms. And what I'm going to do is actually pull up one that's actually been filled in so you can see a real one. logged into our file management system here. So, by the way, this is what a transaction file looks like. This is one of my transaction files. How many documents do you see in there? Lots and lots and lots. That's what a correct 
transaction file looks like. That's how much stuff we have to keep up with. All right, so I'm going to pull up the listing agreement here, and then I'm going to try to zoom it up so you can see. All right, so this is one of my old listing agreements right here. All right. So this is an exclusive right to sell listing. Now, if you notice, I've uh, identified the seller up there and identified the listing firm. Now, what's odd on this one is that I've actually identified two listing firms. So this is something you don't need to know for the test, but in the real world, because my commissions are paid to an LLC, because I've incorporated myself, then that LLC also has to be one of the listing firms. That's why you see two firms listed here, not just United Real Estate Raleigh, but you see my LLC listed as the firm there as well. But this is a you know a properly completed listing agreement. It's listed right to sell listing. It lists the seller, it lists the firm, okay? Um, and you scroll down, and it says that the effective date of the agreement is gonna be the date it's been signed by both the seller and the firm. There's also the possibility to have the effective date be when. If you look at that next option down there. It says the property's currently listed where? With another firm. Is everybody looking at this? You need to be making notes, by the way, and I gave you that copy for a reason. You need to be making notes as you go through it, okay? It says the property's listed with another firm. And if the property's listed with another firm, I need to list the date that that agreement's going to what? Expire. It's going to expire because I can't list it at the same time some other firm has it listed. So why is that option there? What kind of seller am I talking to? They're already listed with somebody else, but what? Time to expire. It's going to expire and they're not satisfied with them so they're not going to renew. Uh -huh. So they're talking to me to list it after the current one expires. Does that make sense for you guys? Mm -hmm. yeah, right? That's what that option would be for. That second option there. And for this one, that didn't apply because it was not listed with somebody else. Notice we have an expiration date. The listing agreement was going to expire on, on, on Halloween 2017. The address of the property. And then we have the legal description of the property there. Uh, where do you think I'm going to pull that legal description from? From what? From the MLS, no, I'm no, putting no, stuff no. in the MLS. Uh, remember, remember, the source of information in the MLS is who? The listing broker, right? From the deed. That'd be a good place to put a legal description. So where would I find the deed? Courthouse. At the county courthouse. Do I have to physically go to the county courthouse? No. No, thankfully I have these magic little machines here that allow me to search all those documents at the county courthouse. So I, would I need to pull a copy of the deed? Would I need to download a copy of the deed? so that I have the legal description of the property? Yeah, absolutely. That would be a good idea. And that's what I did here. I pulled a copy of the deed and got the legal description of the property and filled it in there. Now, section three is interesting. Remember, we talked about fixtures earlier in the class. Everybody remembers that discussion, right? Yes. How, on a test, how are you gonna determine if something is a fixture? Is it nailed, glued, or screwed? And if that's a yes, then what other question are you going to ask yourself? Who put it there? Was it the owner of the property or was it a tenant? Good. That's if the contract doesn't say anything about what are fixtures. Can the buyer and the seller agree on a sales contract that other things are going to be considered fixtures or not going to be considered fixtures? Yes. So. What we have here is that the Association of Realtors has basically tried to avoid arguments by coming up with a list of very common things that fall into dispute in transactions and saying, for the purposes of this listing agreement, these things are considered what? <laughs> fixtures. Whether you think they're fixtures or not doesn't matter. This listing agreement is declaring that these things on this list will be considered what? Fixtures. Fixtures. Does everybody follow that thinking? So, mm -hmm. so your seller, they already have that. Um, so they can come through here with you and be like, well, I'm going to X that out. Because well, that's a wonderful question. So I'm, I'm, what I'm hearing is 
how would they not have that be included? Because if it's a fixture, it's going to be included in the transaction, right? So let's pick one of these things. Let's say, like, for example, um, over here, okay? Um, alarm and security systems for security, fire, smoke, carbon monoxide, or other toxins with all related access codes, sensors, cameras, dedicated monitors, hard drives, video recorders, power supplies and cables and doorbells and chimes. That's a pretty extensive list, right? How many of you have a camera system in your house? I have one to watch my dogs. Isn't that sad? That, I mean, I literally have one to watch the damn dogs when I'm not at the house, you know? But according to this listing agreement, that camera system became what? A fixture. According to the, so, your question is, well, what if I see that and I'm like, I don't want to leave that. I just bought the thing. I want to take it to the next house. I need to watch the dogs at the next house. I don't know what they do all day other than sleep, but we got to watch them sleep apparently. So, if I want to do that, what do I need to do? I need to exclude them somehow. Well, you know, one thought process is I could cross them out, but if I look on the next page, where it says other items that do not convey, couldn't I list things there and accept them? Yep. I said, I could, it says the following item shall not convey, and if I, those items will be excluded. So couldn't I list my camera system there? Yes. Well, they gave us a place. Before. I'm sorry? Well, you can take it out before they come before. Is it this evening? Or I could remove it before we listed the property, right? Because this on, this list only includes things that are there once the property is actually listed. So those are two different approaches. Does that make sense? Now I'm going to ask a really important question. Is this really the document that matters as far as fixtures are concerned? No. What document really matters? The sales contract. This is not the sales contract. This is just the listing agreement. This is really here as like instructions for the listing broker on what things you're going to tell the buyer do convey and don't convey. Does that make sense? That's why it's in here. Everybody good with that? So we want to deal with the, we want to deal with fixtures. Once we deal with fixtures, what's the next logical thing to deal with? What's the opposite of a fixture? Personal property. So if you look at uh, paragraph four there. Personal property, it says the following personal property shall be transferred to the buyer at no value at closing. And in this case, what personal property were we including as part of the sales price? The refrigerator. We were including the refrigerator as personal property in that listing. Now again, would this being here protect the buyer for that refrigerator? Yes. No, no, because it's not contract. the actual... Because it's not the what? The sales contract. So, even though it's listed here as conveying with the sale, that's only there to tell the listing broker that they should what? Put it into... Advertise it that it's part of the sale. But the buyer and the buyer's agent should make sure that it's included in what document? The sales contract. Does everybody follow through on that? The stuff that's here has got to get transferred over to the sales contract at some point. Okay? Everybody good with that? All right. Uh, there, I'm not going to spend time on the home warranty section here. Section 5 deals with home warranty. You could choose to offer or not offer a home warranty, and that's going to be up to you and the seller, whatever kind of discussion you want to have ahead of time, whether or not you're going to agree to market the property with a home warranty. The buyer is going to have the opportunity to ask for one as part of their offer anyway, so it's really just up to you whether or not you want to advertise it as including the home warranty. Most likely, a home warranty is going to be included in the transaction because most buyers, even if you don't advertise it with one, will ask for one on resale properties, obviously. New construction, you wouldn't so much. Now, Section 6 is kind of important. Would you agree? Yes. Why? Price. Why is that number so important? Our commission comes from that number. Isn't this also the bar of when we've done our job? Yes. Remember, we said commission is due when we produce what? A ready, willing, and able buyer. What if we bring them a cash offer of $170,000? Have we done our job? 
So at that point, is it even necessary for them to accept the offer for us to be owed a commission? No. 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 If we bring them a full price cash offer, folks, they owe us a commission. Whether they accept the offer or not, because that we have done the job. So does that mean this number is important? Absolutely. Absolutely. And we also want to indicate the way that they're okay with getting that number. In this case, they were okay with either cash or what? Cash or conventional financing. And so we'll talk about the different types of loans that are available later in the class, but there was a reason on this particular one that I did not check FHA, VA, or USDA. This particular property didn't qualify for those kinds of financing. It was a condo in downtown Raleigh, and I knew that it would not qualify for those kinds of financing. So the only financing I put that the seller was willing to accept was either cash, which most people are willing to accept, or conventional financing. Okay? How do you know that? How do I know that? Experience. Well, I mean, yeah. okay. Experience. I mean, that's just the blunt answer. The reason I knew it would not qualify for FHA, VA, or USDA, condos are treated very special as far as financing goes. Lenders are very reluctant to lend on condos in the first place. Why do you think that is? Why would lenders be more reluctant to lend on condos? There it is. I heard somebody say, no land, right? What is the first thing you think of when you think of real estate? Land. What are they not buying when they buy a condo? Land. The lender is taking a much larger risk on a condo than they are on anything else because inherently the thing that gives real estate value is land. Condos don't have any land. So it's a much more risky purchase. Traditionally when the market collapses, you know what collapses first and hardest? Condos. And so there are much stricter rules about financing on condos, and I knew that the way that this particular condo association was structured would never pass the underwriting process of FHA, VA, USDA financing. So I just knew that based on experience. Okay. Yep. Um, when, when you go to explain to a seller that you know, a cash offer has been made, mm -hmm. whether they choose to accept that offer or not, to that you are owed that commission. Mm -hmm. how, how, how do you like really watch, watch, watch your own back for that? Like, how do you, how yeah, do you, you know, it's a, a, so I'm going to have to answer it as a hypothetical question because yeah. bluntly I've never had it happen. I've yeah. never once brought somebody an offer that met or exceeded list price where they would not accept right. an offer. I mean, I've had them not accept full price offers, but that was only because we had offers that were higher than full price, so they were right. accepting an offer. Right. I've never had a situation with a seller where I brought them one or more offers that were full price and they didn't accept one. So I'm kind of going to answer this as a hypothetical sure. how I would handle it. I would probably look at them and go, why? Yeah. What? I mean, what has changed since the time we listed the property that, you know, when we listed at this number and now we've got this number, why are we not accepting this number? So that would be the first discussion I would have with them is what, what has changed? Have you just changed your mind about selling the property? Have you? And if so, why did you wait until I had the offer? Why not have notified me last week you know, or something? Why have we gone down this road? Because at this point in time, here's the problem I have. I'm not just concerned about me not getting paid. Where did the buyer come from? Where'd the buyer most likely come from? Another firm. Are they going to expect to get paid? Yep. Have they done their job if they brought me a full price cash offer? Are they going to be looking for their commission? I can't pay them unless who pays me? The seller. You see what I mean? So I'm in a bind if I get in that situation. And so probably what I would say to the seller is, well, you know, you don't have to accept an offer. I can't force you to accept an offer. However, it is going to be viewed as very underhanded to market a property and then not be willing to sell it for what you've marketed it for. And quite honestly, you now owe a commission to both my firm and the other firm who's produced a buyer because we all operated and worked under the assumption that you were being forthright about this list price. And with the signed listing agreement, that's uh, you know, they owe it. Court, so, Absolutely. You know, so it's, a, it's a legal document. It is a legal document. It is an enforceable legal document. And so they would owe it. So, I mean, if I had to go to court, I would go into court and I would present the listing agreement. I would present the offer that was presented and say, here are the two things. I was hired to produce this. Here I produce this. I want to get paid. That's essentially the argument you make in court. Yes. Yes, ma'am. I have a question. Um, and this just recently happened to me, like, before I got into the, my current home. 
we went to go look at a, a property. The seller's wife was still there. Like okay. she didn't leave. When, she knew we were coming, but she, she didn't, didn't leave during yeah, the show. Yeah, she didn't leave. And so, which is really, really, really off-putting. It was weird. Yeah, it is. <laughs> really weird. And we found out, like, from talking to her, we found out that her husband was the realtor, and he was the one that was like listing it. The house was his dad's, or whatever the case was. So we submitted an offer. We gave them full price, and they came. They came back asking for more than what their full price offer was. Because at one point they actually they lowered it down to whatever that price was, and then they took it back up once we submitted an offer. And they was just like, well, whatever. When you get the home inspection back, we're not gonna fix anything. We'll give you a thousand dollars, but that's it. And you have to close like I don't know, like three days before Christmas. And has anyone ever done it? Because I was like, after I In read this that, market, absolutely. I said, after I read that, I was just like, I don't even want to count off. I'm not doing that. In like, it doesn't market, really make absolutely. sense. Because the sellers feel like they have the buyers over a barrel because there are more buyers than there are properties. And see, the thing about it is, they had three, I, which I found out through my realtor that they had three offers before mine that fell through. They accepted three offers and then they all fell through after whatever. So that would have been information to that would have been useful before you made Exactly. I, I thought the same because thing. Because I would want to know why they had been under contract. She said she couldn't like disclose why they That's not entirely true. I think she, I, I she does now, so let's let's talk about that because it brings up a wonderful discussion here, right? So let's let's lay the facts out and then think about what we talked about last week about disclosure. Remember yeah. that discussion we had about disclosure last week, right? Yeah. We said with material facts, and material facts are anything about the property, anything that relates to the property, anything that relates to the ability of the client to close the transaction, right? Yeah. The, all those are material facts. And what do we say the rule was? We have to disclose any material facts that we know or, should or that we reasonably should have known. Yeah. What's the most likely reason for a house to go under contract mm -hmm. and then that contract to fall apart? A material fact or something in the home inspection. Bingo. Inspection. Buyer goes under contract. The number one reason for that contract to fall apart is the buyer does an inspection and finds something they either don't like or the seller is unwilling to what? Fix. To fix. Does everybody follow through on that? Yeah. Now, just play along with me here. What are the odds that the buyer who goes under contract has an inspection just says, we're terminating the contract and we're not telling you why. What are the odds of it playing out like that? No. What are they going to say to the seller? Well, why? But, yeah, but before they even say they're terminating, what are they going to say to the seller? This is an issue. Hey, this is an issue. We want you to fix this, right? Here's what we found on our inspection. inspection. By the way, and here's a copy of the inspection. This is why we're asking you to fix this because our inspector found this, 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 and this. Should that listing agent now be disclosing that to subsequent buyers? Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. And, see, and that's what, after being in this class, that's what I realized, but he was the, he was living in the house and he was the realtor and he wouldn't tell her why the other offers wouldn't, like, you know, why they all fell through and wouldn't, like, nothing never happened. He wouldn't tell who? He wouldn't tell my realtor, even mm -hmm. though he was a realtor. Is he required to? Yeah, he is. He's required, so. not by being a realtor, but being a licensee, right? The North yeah. Carolina Real Estate Commission, he's required to disclose any material facts he knows about or reasonably should have known about. So, two people didn't do their job there. I hate to step on people's toes, but I have to. Yeah. He didn't disclose things that most likely he found out during the course of those contracts. Agree? Yes. Who also didn't do their job? She did. Your buyer's agent didn't do their job because she should have researched and seen in the MLS that that property had been under contract three times, right? What's the first question she should ask of the listing broker? Why? Why? And then and the <clears throat> listing broker gives you that nonsense answer of I can't disclose. Fine. Did any of these buyers do inspections? Because you can't dodge that question. That is a yes or no question. Would you agree with that? Yes. And the fact that those buyers did inspections or not is a material fact. So if the answer is yes, fine, provide me the inspections. Simple as that. Okay. Yeah, and I know after, like, they came back with their counter offer, which was higher than their full asking price, I said, no, like, I didn't even want to, like, entertain it anymore. And then, like, a week later, they just took it off the market. Mm -hmm. So, and we yeah. live in the same subdivision now. So. Yeah. But, <laughs> 
it seems like to me that neither broker, and that's why understanding the disclosure of material facts is so important no matter which side of the transaction you're on. Because I can't tell you how many times I have saved my clients tens of thousands of dollars by understanding how material facts work and pinning us. You know, if I'm on the buyer side and we find a problem with the home inspection, I'll get you, all right? So you don't have to hold your hand, though, you know. Um, if I find a major problem with a home inspection, and we ask the seller to fix it. In this market, a lot of sellers don't want to fix those things because they feel like they can do what? Sell it to somebody else. There's five other offers we had that were full price. Here's what I'm saying to the listing agent because my job is to fight for the buyer from the buyer's agent, right? Mm -hmm. I'm saying to the listing agent, you're right. They don't have to fix anything. But before you let us walk away, I want you to remember something. I just emailed you 62 pages of problems with this house. When you mark that thing back active in the MLS, the first thing I'm going to check for is all 62 pages of those problems disclosed to subsequent buyers. And you can bet that if you mark it active and you don't disclose every single one down to that cover that's missing on the electrical plate in the kitchen, I'm going to be calling 875-3700 and providing them with a copy of the inspection report and a copy of your listing that doesn't disclose these items. Now, tell your seller that and ask them what makes more sense, fixing this for my buyer or telling somebody about 62 pages worth of shit that's wrong with this house. What do you think they're most likely to do? <laughs> After they call me an asshole, I mean. What are they most likely to do? <laughs> they're going to fix it. What was my job? To protect the buyer. Protect the buyer. Did I do my job? Yes. And I did it by knowing what? The law. The law. And throwing the law at them as hard as I could throw it. Have you ever actually done that? All the time. <laughs> oh, like, oh, have you lost any friends? Huh? There ain't no friends in war. <laughs> but you know what? What people have is a grudging respect for you when you do that. See, what you have to learn is set the person on side. When an agent does that to me, I don't get mad at them. I hang up the phone and I say, good job. Because don't they have a job to do? Yes. And their job is to keep me in check just like my job is to keep them in check. We, we are fighting for different clients, correct? Mm -hmm. And by the way, I wouldn't have to do that if they were doing it correct in the first place. Does that make sense? And you only have to get tough when they're not doing it right in the first place. But what I have found is that when you know the rules and you can, it, on the spot, fire them at somebody and put the fear of the real estate commission in them, they will most likely do the right thing and that usually results in a positive result for your client. Make sense? See, understanding these rules can go a long way toward getting things done for you. And I love to use that even on my own clients. If I'm on the seller's side and a buyer's asking us for a bunch of repairs, the seller's natural inclination is to say what? No. No, I'm not fixing that. I'm going to use the same ammunition with my own seller. I'm going to say, that's fine. You don't have to fix anything, but here's what we do have to do. If we put it back on the market because this buyer walks away, we got to take that whole 60 pages worth of stuff that's wrong and we got to publish it now for every other buyer that looks at your house. Which do you think is going to end up costing you more money? Scaring every buyer in the world to death with all these 60 pages or fixing the five things they actually asked us to fix? What do you think my seller's going to say then? Let's fix the five. Let's go ahead and fix it. Damn it. <laughs> See, it works both ways. It really does. You know, and, and it's, all, it's only about holding people accountable for what the law actually says. You know? and, and you do have to sometimes, unfortunately, be tough about that. That's part of the deal. No, you're not allowed in here. Hi. Need something? No, I'm just being nosy. Oh, you can be nosy all you like. We're talking about listing agreements. <laughs> all right? So, we've got the list price there. Now, paragraph 7. In my opinion, the most important paragraph in the whole thing. <laughs> the firm's compensation. We remember, we're filling this thing out because we want to get what? Hey. hey. Now, if you notice in this one, I was charging a relatively lofty 7%. And I say relatively because I not only um, managed the complete renovation of this property, but I funded the complete renovation of this property and was not reimbursed until closing. So there is some monetary value there to funding and managing. The seller didn't have anything to do with it. I replaced the kitchen, I replaced the bathrooms, repainted the entire place, refinished the floors, 
the kitchen floor. It was not an inexpensive thing. Now, I was reimbursed for all that out of closing, but of course I had to float that cash, which is why the high 7% listing commission. High for me, because again, it's about what I charge, not any sort of a normal or standard charge, right? Is everybody okay with that? Mm -hmm. All right. So the firm is going to be paid 7%, and it goes through when the fee is earned. It says the fee shall be deemed earned under any of the following circumstances. And then what's the first phrase that pops up? Ready, if a ready, willing, and able buyer is procured by the firm, a competing firm, the seller, or anyone else. That's how we know it's an exclusive right to sell, because it says no matter where the buyer comes from, if they come from Mars, we're still owed a commission. No matter where they come from. So that's kind of like your go-to statement in, in court, too. In case what we were talking about earlier, not paying through, mm -hmm. you know, somebody falling through on, you know, committing to, you know, it's not their word anymore because they have a signed document. They have a signed document saying that we were, that, that we owed a commission no matter how the buyer was produced during the term of this agreement. If you look in that last little subparagraph on the bottom of page two, you have the extender clause. Remember we talked about that extender clause? We said it extends it past its expiration. Read the language of that. It says, if the circumstances set out in one or two above have not occurred, and if within, in this case, we filled in 30 days after the expiration of the agreement, the seller sells the property to somebody that became interested, then we're still owed a commission, right? That's what the extender clause does. But notice it says, however, in all caps. Zoom it up. However, in all caps. What does it say after that? Selling shall not be obligated to pay a fee if a valid listing agreement is entered between the seller and another real estate. So they're not obligated to pay us if they do what? If they hire somebody else. If they hire somebody else. So that extender clause is only good if they don't hire another firm. Are you okay with that? All right. It goes on to talk about when the fee is due or payable. Um, and of course, it says normally we would collect the fee at closing or, in case things go bad, the seller's failure to close after accepting some offer. Um, if, I'm going to scroll down now to paragraph 8. Cooperation with other real estate firms. This is where we agree to do a co-brokered transaction. Would everybody agree with that? This is where we agree to a co-brokered transaction. And in this case, if you notice, I had the seller authorize me to cooperate with agents or firms representing who? Buyers. Buyers. In this case, we authorize to cooperate with firms representing buyers and offer them what compensation? 2.4% of the total sales price. Now, this is not in addition to the seven that was being charged on page number one. Does everybody understand that? Mm -hmm. This is a reduction from that seven. So this is taken out of that seven. Therefore, the number on page one better not be lower than the number on page two. <laughs> they also better not be the same number. I've seen these come in and you get 3% on page one and 3% on page two. So I look at the agent and I say, so you're working for free. No, 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 I'm charging 3%. Yes, but you're paying 3% out. So what is three minus three? <laughs> Nothing, right? <laughs> You're getting paid the difference between what's on page one and what's on this line. Does that make sense for everybody? So in this case, I was getting paid 4.6%. Okay? Everybody all right with that? All right? It goes through and it talks about what the firm's duties were, are. And obviously, to represent the best interest of the seller and try to you know, find a, uh, a ready, willing, and able buyer. It takes a lot of words to say that, apparently. Look at the top of page four. All bold in caps. What is that? That is an anti-discrimination statement. Remember we said that every agency agreement must have an anti-discrimination statement. We said it's not there for the broker or the firm. It's there for who? The seller, so that they know that we can't discriminate. In this case, it says 
The firm shall conduct all brokerage activities in regard to this agreement without respect. And I said, how, how many protected classes did I say there were? Seven. 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 Race, color, religion, sex, national origin, handicap, or familial status. There's the seven protected classes of any party um, to the agreement. Actually, and this is an interesting thing to point out, those are the seven federal protected classes. When we talk about federal fair housing law, those are the seven things that the federal government says you cannot discriminate on the basis of. The Association of Realtors is more strict than that. So this would only apply if you're a realtor. Of course, if you're using this form, are you a realtor? Yeah, because yeah, this is a realtor form. It says, further, realtors have an ethical duty to conduct such activities without respect to the sexual orientation or gender identity of any party or prospective party to this agreement. So if you are a realtor, you are agreeing to not only just not discriminate on the seven federal protected classes, but additionally on these two protected classes. That is part of the Realtor Code of Ethics. If you join the Association of Realtors, you swear to abide by the Realtor Code of Ethics, and that is included as part of the Realtor Code of Ethics. Um, they are not federal protected classes, but they are protected under the Association of Realtors Code of Ethics. Therefore, if you do discriminate on the basis of those two things, you wouldn't be guilty of a fair housing violation, but you could be kicked out of the Association of Realtors. That makes sense? Yeah. Kind of understand the differentiation there? Yeah, go ahead, Brian. What about age? Age is not a protected class. We can discriminate against old people all we like. <laughs> <laughs> but we can't discriminate against young people, particularly young people. This one right here, Familial status, it's a confusing name. You know what familial status means? People with kids. Children. Not people with kids, it means children. Familial status is people under the age of 18. So we cannot discriminate against people under the age of 18, but we can discriminate against anybody else based on their age. It is a perfectly legal thing to put a sign out front that says, nobody over the age of 25 allowed. It might not be nice, but it's legal. Age is not a protected class. It's a good question. So the retirement health care. What I thought of was because a lot of people retire in Florida, and I'm pretty sure it's different there. No? So that's a national. Federal protected Federal, class. Yeah. Here's what you're confusing. You're confusing discriminating against age with making com communities okay. specifically about age. See, I can say 55 and up community right. because that's not discriminating against age, correct? Does that make sense? Yeah. And actually, it is because if I'm saying 55 and up, I'm saying you can't be under the age of 55, right? It actually is an age discrimination thing. Does that, does that make sense? Because I'm saying somebody who's 35 can't be in there. And the only reason they can't be in there is because they're 35. So it's not protected. With me on that? Age not a protected class. It is a very conspicuous absence when you start looking at that list. It's a pretty broad list. And, and we're not in the fair housing chapter, but what I'll tell you what this means. The word discriminate is defined very broadly in the fair housing statute. Here's the way you should read the word discriminate. Cannot talk about. When you see a broker cannot discriminate on the basis of race, color, religion, national origin, sex, familial status, handicapping status. What that should read is, a broker cannot talk about. You can't have a discussion about any of those things. The questions are off limits. Somebody ask you, in this area, we're a melting pot. Would you agree that with that? Every culture, every nationality, every religious background, I mean we have you know, people from every walk of life. Do you agree with that in this area? Are there people who may come to you and want to be around other families of their same ethnic back background or their same religious makeup? Uh, is that true? Mm -hmm. So I'll give you an example. One time I had a, um, an, a family that had moved here from China. One of the first questions they asked was, are there any other Asian families in this neighborhood? Now, were they asking it in a negative way? In other words, were they being nasty, discriminatory? Why were they asking? Because they wanted to be in a neighborhood. Question still off limits. I can't answer that question. 
because just talking about the topic when it comes to housing is off limits. Familial status, I said, what does that mean? Children. Children, so what's off limits? Children. Children. Is this a good neighborhood for kids? Can I answer that question? No. Nope. nope. Can I answer that question? So you would say, I can answer this question, or would you like try to like... I have to say I can't answer that okay. question. I know, I'm going to try to smooth it over. I'm going to say, as crazy as it sounds, I can't answer that question. Because I'm not allowed to talk about children because they're actually protected by the federal fair housing laws. But what I want you to do is make a decision about a neighborhood that, on whatever makes you comfortable with the neighborhood. So if you can tell me what you're looking for, I will make sure we find that. Can they say I want a neighborhood close to the elementary school? Yes. Yeah. Elementary school is not a protected class. The things that attend the elementary school are a protected class, <laughs> but the school itself is not. Is a park a protected class? No. No. So could I show them a park? Yeah. Could I show them that the elementary school is across the street? Yeah. Absolutely. I can't answer the question, though, is it a good neighborhood for kids, because I can't talk about kids. Does that make sense for everybody? Okay. It's a fine line we walk with the fair housing laws. But we do have to have that statement in there. It's required that statement be in there. All right. They have to give us permission of what kind of marketing we're going to do, and I'm not going to go through that with you now. These are things that you would want to read in detail when you're actually taking the listing down the road. But they do have to authorize the different types of marketing, like whether or not we can put a sign in front of it, and can we hold open houses, can we place it in the MLS, can we put a lockbox on the front door, all those kinds of things. Um, uh, so um, as we scroll down, if you look at paragraph... Um, 11 and I do love this warning that we put in here this warning did not used to be there um, that's on uh, just above paragraph 11 notice it says it may be a crime under federal and state law to listen to or record an oral communication through the use of any electronic mechanical or other device without the consent of a party to that communication why are we giving this warning to the seller what might they have in their house Cameras, and cameras are okay, but not cameras that take audio. Visual recordings are generally not protected under the law, but audio recordings are. That's considered wiretapping. So, if your sellers have cameras in the house, you have to make sure that those cameras don't have microphones on them. And if they do, they have to be disabled during the showings, because it's actually a federal crime to listen in on those conversations when the house is being shown to buyers. Okay? I laugh because when we were looking at houses when we were purchased, because my wife was the real estate agent and she was you know, taking me and yep. we were going to look at and she first thing she always said before we walk in is don't say anything about what you like or dislike about the house or anything like that. Like, they couldn't listen. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah, they're not supposed to be, but yeah, I, right. I, I tell my clients the same thing because I'm yeah. like even though they're not supposed to, how would we know? It you know, it doesn't mean it doesn't happen yeah. because people don't realize it's against the law. They think it's their house, they can do whatever they want, right. but they're not in their house. You know, the only time it, it is legal for them to have cameras with microphones when they're in their house, which is obviously going to be 99% of the time because they're one of the parties to those conversations, mm -hmm. but not when somebody else is in the house because they're not a party to the conversation at that point. That's eavesdropping. And when you ele eavesdrop electronically, it's called wiretapping. And that's the whole point of we giving this warning is saying, you know, because cameras have become so prevalent, we're giving this warning to say, listen, not only is it not kosher to do this because you may be eavesdropping on somebody what they're saying about the contract, but you also may be committing a felony without realizing it, you know. Um, and and you can bet if they have access to it, they're going to listen. <laughs> I mean, that's just human nature that they're going to. So as a broker, you need to be warning them about that. Don't do that. Um, Let's see here. What else do we need to talk about in here? If there's an owner's association, you should list that and contact information for the owner's association. Um, don't need to talk about anything else on page five. Um, or a lot of this are things that you would obviously need to fill out and understand when you're taking a real estate, but I'm trying to only hit on the high spots that you would need for testing right now. Okay. If you look at the bottom of page six, there is an interesting section in there. If there's a manufactured home on the property, what do you need to include? The VIN number 
of the manufactured home because if you don't, it's not part of the sale. Remember, manufactured homes are what kind of property? Personal, Personal property. So if there's a manufactured home there, if it's going to be included, you need to put the VIN number of that manufactured home. All right, and continue to scroll forward. A lot of this is just marketing. Scroll to paragraph number 17. One of the most important sections of the listing agreement. Every agency agreement's got to have a section regarding dual agency. We need permission to do dual agency, don't we? And we need what kind of permission? Written permission. Now, can we get oral permission for dual agency for a limited time? Yes. From which party? The buyer. The buyer and only the buyer. Because the buyer might have what kind of an agency agreement? An oral agreement. If they have an oral agency agreement, it stands to reason they could give us oral permission for dual agency. But the listing agreement's always what? In writing. In writing. That means the, the seller has to make a choice in writing from the very beginning of whether or not they choose to allow dual agency. Does that make sense for everybody? So now in this section, we've got a very long, and I'm not going to go through it all because we've already talked about this, description of what dual agency is and what things the seller would be sacrificing if they choose to allow dual agency. What, just kind of quickly remind me. Advice. They sacrifice advice. What else? Our, there's some disclosure items. Remember that when we talked about disclosure last week? We said if you go into dual agency, there would be things that we would normally tell the seller. Like, if you knew that the buyer is willing to pay more than they've offered, would you normally tell your seller client that information? Normally. Yeah. If you're a dual agent, you tell your seller client their information. No. So they're sacrificing advice, they're sacrificing disclosure. Those are the big sacrifices that they're making here. And so this is a very long description of that that the seller is being warned if you agree to dual agency you are agreeing to allow those things and then we get to the actual permission there's three lines there for the permission at the bottom of page eight the first two are either or first of all please don't do this my brokers have done this for years and it drives me out of my mind when i see it you can't have initials on all three of these lines Look at the first two. Just read the very first sentence of the first line. Seller authorizes the firm to act as what? Dual, Dual agent. agent. Now look at the next one. Seller desires exclusive representation during this agreement and does no. not. Can you initial both those lines at the same time? No. They do it all the time. <laughs> like, what are you just dumb or like, one's not getting through here. It's one or the other. It's always one or the other of these two lines. Now look at line three. What are they authorizing with line three? Designated. Designated. Seller hereby authorizes the firm to designate an individual agent. Now remember, designated agency is a form of what? Dual. Dual. So if the third line is initial, what must also be initial? The first one. Okay? So you can have line one by itself. If line one by itself was the only one initial, what would the seller be authorizing? True dual agency, but not designated dual agency. If only line number two is initial, what would they be authorizing? Exclusive. So no dual agency at all of any type. And if lines one and three are initial, what are they authorizing? both true dual agency and designated dual agency. What if just line number three is initial? What are they authorizing? Who the hell knows? Because you can't do it that way, right? <laughs> is everybody okay with that? All right. So in this case, what were we authorizing? All forms of agency, right? And, and people say to me, I didn't think your firm practiced true dual agency. Well, we don't. But we do practice what? Designated, and I can't authorize designated without first authorizing what? Dual. It's just the way the form works. So the only way to get designated is lines one and three. Okay? Quick question. Yep. As far as the test, um, you know, taking, what are, like, are we just understanding how the form is set up and, mm -hmm. and for 
test taking purposes. Mm -hmm. Just so we know what's included in, in the listing agreement. Exactly. So those bullet points that I've given you on the slides, mm -hmm. the things I specifically said, it has to have an expiration date. It has to have an anti-discrimination clause. you got to specify the compensation. Those are going to be the things they hit you with on the okay. exam. All right. All right. So you do not need to study all 10 pages of this form. Right. I'm just going through this so you have a basic familiarity with where those things we talked about, where they're located within the form. All right? And then that's it. My signature page, and of course we want the signature of all the sellers. Notice, we also identified the broker who was signing on behalf of the firm, right? Which was me, my license number, the date it was signed, and these were digital signatures, by the way. If you have not familiarized yourself yet with digital signatures, that's a digital signature that was applied digitally. And the thing I like about digital signatures is it time and date stamps them when they are signed as well. So you can and you can actually go back and track, do an audit track on that to see what email address it was emailed to, when they logged in, when they signed it. You know, it creates a nice audit trail for you in that regard. Now there's one other thing now that we've, um, uh, I don't know, sorry, got ahead of myself. Got ahead of myself, I do that <laughs> My brain's clicking on too many things at once. Any questions about this? Everybody feel pretty good about a listing agreement now? And again, this is what kind of listing agreement? What type? This is the exclusive right to sell, which is by far the most common, okay? But make sure you are familiar for test taking purposes with also the exclusive agency and the open listing. So at least you can, because you'll probably see one test question where you have to, then they'll describe, you know, the, under this situation the firm doesn't get paid and you'll have to choose which listing agreement that lines up with. So there'll be at least one question like that. Yeah. If this is an exclusive right to sell, mm -hmm. why would they even have those back here? Why would they have what back there? Um, where it, they give you the the options for dual agent, designated agency, or, I mean, exclusive representation. Like, why will all three be back here if this is an exclusive right to sell form? Because they still, even when it's still an exclusive listing, even when they're authorizing dual agency. Because they've only hired how many firm to represent them. Okay. When you hire one firm, that's, the, that's where the word exclusive comes from. Okay. Okay, I think I got it now. Because mm -hmm. If a buyer comes up as a buyer with their firm, this is basically saying, hey, if a buyer does come, I'm allowing you to possibly... To show it to that okay. buyer that okay. you also represent. I got it. That's got exactly it. right. Okay. It's like permission in advance in case one of the buyers of your firm... Because remember, this is like directions on how to market the property, right? Yeah. So tell me, as a broker in charge, what I would have to do, if I see a listing agreement come across my desk, that the second line is initial here. It says the seller desires exclusive representation. What do I probably need to do? Well, I know we're not doing dual agency, but how am I going to convey that? What do I need to do? Let them know that they, all the buyers. Let who know? Let the seller know. That not way. only the seller, the who firm. else? Let the firm. Let the firm know. Don't I have to send all my brokers an email saying you cannot show this listing? Yeah. If that comes across my desk with that line initial, don't I have to send an email out to everybody and say the seller is not allowing you to show this listing? You see it in the MLS, tell your buyers they can't look at it. Don't I have to? Yes. So the, it, it matters. You know? okay. So that means don't I have to get this in early before that thing goes in the MLS so I have a chance to do that as a broker in charge. Yeah. Everybody good with that? All right. So let's take a, our little lunch break and come back at 10 minutes past. Okay? 10 past 1.